Yeah, look who it is. Hello. Uh, Sean, they were starting to get worried. Chance said, uh, uh, Sean's late. Maybe too late. Bruckner here beat you to it. <laughs> and then uh, he also said uh, he was worried that maybe you got uh, clipped by one of those bike messengers. Not well, you know. uh, luckily, no such mis misfortune has befallen me. <laughs> Sean, 20 years, my friend. J just so everyone, in case anyone here doesn't know, um, this is uh, my good friend and associate, my my co-teller of so much, uh, my podcast partner, Sean Merritt, the man himself. And, uh, uh, here, here I am. Yeah. Uh, everyone's saying hi on this side, Sean. Like I said, I know that um, you can't see what's going on on, on your side, but uh, Super John Yo says the man himself. What a handsome fellow. <laughs> uh, Super Johnny, oh, an old, an old friend of the channel. Our old, um, uh, our, our other uh, friend IB, who you know, again, we got to thank you IB for putting together those great edits for our our TikTok channel. Says uh, you better have brought the cranberry, Sean. <laughs> only you know the best kind is the one that uh, you can only get them after beating an old lady with a stick. IB loves that joke. IB makes that reference. Almost every time he shows up to a live, uh, so so you your kindred spirits on that. Uh, uh, user sixty eight says hello, fellow king, Sean. Hello, oh. hello, fellow kid. <laughs> ah. uh, have I checked out the prequel novel for the Batman? No, I haven't. I haven't. I was just talking about novels recently. We we're looking at. Uh, uh, the film novelization, the explosive mm. tale of Marvel Comics crime fighting superhero Spider Man. He says on the back. <laughs> well, um, uh, as you requested yesterday, Peter, I can officially, I am proud to say that I have my uh, copy of May 2002's Nickelodeon magazine. Um, you can see here on the front cover, very, very nice picture of Spider Man. And in fact, there is a uh, pretty extensive interview here with. Uh, Toby Maguire and uh, Kirsten Dunst, so pretty fun to read. Um, I could, yeah, I, maybe maybe I could read some excerpts yeah, here. Yeah, maybe read some excerpts. I know we talked about before. I think there's like an interesting comment about like their favorite foods. You know, is funny. Um, oh, please yes. feel free. Uh, so, Nickelodeon magazine asked a number of questions of Toby Maguire here. Um, one of, yeah, the one Peter's referring to is, uh, did you have any favorite foods on the set? Toby responded, quote, yeah, everything that I couldn't eat. I had to avoid the cookies and M&Ms and stuff. I was on a very specific eating regimen. Uh, and then they asked them since this was the green themed issue of Nickelodeon magazine, do you have any favorite green foods? Toby McGuire's answer, quote, artichokes are really good. I also like broccoli. And avocado on toast with chips. So, um, he really believes it when he says, eat your green vegetables. That's not yeah. accurate right there. <laughs> True to life. What a, what a silly thing. What a silly thing to be sitting down to an interview and being like, yeah, this is our green issue. Uh, what do you have to say on the subject of green foods? <laughs> uh, I, was, I was sort of comparing, too... Um, my Disney Adventures, which has Spider-Man on it. Uh, and again, some of the questions here are just kind of, you know, um, maybe more like what you'd expect mm -hmm. uh, from a kid. Like, uh, I mean, for, for a kid's magazine, like, um, what was it like being hoisted in the air by Doc Ock's tentacles? Or, you know, how does a scientist turn into a supervillain? But... Uh, but, uh, like, what I liked is that, like, someone asked, the, the interviewer also asked Sam Raimi about his car, the classic, you know. Mm -hmm. And Sam talks about his uh, 1973 Delta 88 Oldsmobile and gives a little spiel about that. And I love that because, like, what kid wants to hear about that? But, but I did as a kid. This was the first time I learned about it from this issue back in 2004. Also on so, the subject of food, mm -hmm. in this interview, they asked uh, Alfred Molina, does Dr. Octopus eat seafood? To which he says, I'll eat anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Um, so in this in this in this magazine, um, they asked Kirsten Dunst, did you get to do any stunts for the movie? And she said, yes, I did tons of stunts. I was hanging on wires more than Toby was sometimes. Hmm. So you get some interesting, interesting inf information about uh, the production of the movie. Apparently, uh, yeah, she did quite a few of her own stunts. Uh, Toby Do you remember there well. me of something she said in the um, in the audio commentary? Do you remember we were watching the audio commentary, and uh, she mentions like, "Well, that's me in the Spider-Man suit in this scene." <laughs> sometimes, sometimes I'm, I'm I'm me in the suit. Uh, and, and then like she was also like where does he get that trident from <laughs> she was so, she was so, hilarious in the, the commentary so this is really cool um, just you know, this perfectly dovetails with our nostalgia episode that we just put out today but um, mm -hmm. so I'm just flipping through the Nickelodeon magazine here and they actually have a, a full page ad here for pop tarts and I don't know if you can see but they it's like a blue frosting with like blue spider web on the pop tart and they have a little insect so cool. here with spider-man on it so basically uh at the time uh they had spider-man movie themed pop tarts and they they had a full color ad uh full page ad here nickelodeon magazine so that is so cool that <laughs> red and blue I, I remember having those at the time man i wish i could have that again i think they have made pop tarts for um the other Spider-Mans as well. I don't know if they're quite the same thing, though. My brother John on my side says he remembers his Pop-Tarts as well. My brother Matthew says he thinks he remembers those. Uh, Super Johnio mentions what a millennial Toby was with that avocado toast. <laughs> I was um, thinking that. Um, he, was kind of, uh, he was kind of ahead of the curve on that. Trendsetter. Um, uh, Cynthia says, lol, avocado toast is good, though. Uh, uh, so so user, another... user 68 mentions that Toby will be Charlie Chaplin in a movie, and I think that's interesting. Oh. Boy, he's Rocket really like Boy, Toby seems to have a pension for playing uh, people or characters like from the 1920s. You know, uh, Great Gatsby, Charlie Chaplin. You know, he's really, uh, really seems to have a fondness for the silent movie era. It's two. Yeah, interesting. Well, interesting. Yeah. Uh, Super Johnny, I see, he says, Happy Spider Versary. Um, uh, oh yeah, IB jokes that Doc Ock uh, really loves those Butterfingers. Uh, <laughs> uh, Super Johnny says he definitely ate those uh, Pop Tarts at the time. They, they, you know that I, they, I think it was the same flavor as like, uh, you know, they still make them. It's like those Pop Tarts with like the raspberry filling with like the purple icing and the blue, you know, lines on top of that purple icing. Those are still my favorite. I love those. Um, yeah. I, I remember they used to have a watermelon flavor briefly that I, I liked uh, from our youth. But I just love seeing those advertisements, too. That's one of the things we said in our memories episode. I loved being bombarded. Like the It, it was almost like um, like Christmas, you know, like Christmas happens or Halloween. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, like the world around you starts changing. Everyone gets in on it. Like there's decorations on streets, in stores, yeah. on people's houses. And like. It kind of felt like that, you know. The Star Wars movies were like this too, but it was just everywhere. It was in magazines. There were mm -hmm. the the tiny promotions on television. Um, you know, your Pop Tarts all of a sudden were Spider Man Pop Tarts. Your cereal was Spider Man cereal. I've got my Spider Man three cereal box up there still. Uh, I loved that, and I loved that specific design that they had for like the the marketing of Spider Man one two. Mm -hmm. Something just inextricably linked in my memory, my nostalgia for that. Not to mention, okay. speaking of pop tarts too, it's hard. Like they Whoa. got the. I don't know, hold, hold, have you ever noticed here. that like pretty prominent pop tarts advertisement during the train scene in Spider Man Two? Like it really kind of stands out. Like if you're looking for it, because the city's kind of gray, and all of a mm -hmm. sudden there's just like this like blue purple pop tarts thing as Peter's swinging onto the train. Oh, so um, I just I just want to give a quick shout out here to KJ Gabriel from Cork, Ireland. Uh, who says, love the podcast, guys. Thanks for what you do. Uh, to that, I respond, uh, Slancha. Uh, I, I hope I'm saying that right. I'm probably not, but uh, I have a lot of Irish ancestry. I'd love to visit uh, the Emerald Isle someday. So thank you for tuning in. Um, really, uh, really humbling to have uh, anybody listening to us from anywhere in the world, uh, let alone 
um, you know, a place that has, you know, my family still has so much um, affinity for. So uh, thank you. Yeah, I'd like to second that. Thanks for listening to the show. I really appreciate that. Um, I also see on your your chat, Sean, um, Chance Bailey Trey mentions that Toby also has an Apple TV show with Forrest Whitaker coming out. Hmm. And uh, Ivy mentions that Nick Carraway is Peter Parker's ancestor. They're calling it. That's their their headcanon. Hmm. Um, and Super Johnny on your side says it was a hype event, a once in a lifetime holiday. In in, in as far as uh, pop tarts go, Cynthia says that she's boring. She always liked the strawberry pop tarts the best. Strawberry is my least favorite of the pop tarts. I gotta say, I mean, I, just, I, I will, I will say that. Um... I will say that I actually, sorry, I'm uh, uh, sorry. Um, yeah, I was just going to say, I actually love the uh, brown sugar cinnamon ones. I still do. I, I don't get pop tarts that much anymore, but um, that one, yeah, those, I always, I still like those, uh, those ones quite a bit. They're okay. I got to be in the right mood for the brown cinnamon sugar ones. I think part of it was that like when we were in college, um, I would like woof the strawberry pop tarts on my way to class running late. And I think like there was no enjoyment in my eating of those. It was simply to sustain my continued existence. And mm -hmm. it was doing that repeatedly. It was just such an unenjoyable experience. I, 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 that's a big reason why I don't like the strawberry pop tarts anymore, but I agree with Dominique, the s'mores pop tarts absolutely slap. <laughs> um, and yes, it was nice for my mom to keep all the, let me keep, all kind of random boxes and stuff uh, at so, the time. So just since we're talking about cereals and Pop-Tarts and things, uh, one of the joys of going through this old magazine is seeing ads for cereals that I don't know. I don't think they exist anymore. Do they still make Oreo-O's? Um, that... I think they just recently came back because yeah. I think I had them not too long ago. <laughs> and I was very excited to see them again. It's just, Cynthia doesn't you, like you know, the when, you're, when you're a kid, like this okay. magazine, like just, it, it's it, like it speaks to your whole world. Uh, what cereal, what junk food you want to buy. I mean, they have so many candy ads in here. It's crazy. They have ads for M&Ms, for these Red Hots, for these uh, Frosted Flakes. Um, um, you know, extreme jello gel sticks. I mean, this is, you can't make this up. I was looking at, the, uh, well, in, in this particular magazine, we got like, hey, where's the ogre filling? Uh, which is playing the hey, where's the cream oh. filling, which I don't think they use that ad campaign anymore. But, um, but like, speaking of, like, how these things appeal to your whole world, uh, apparently this, this issue of Disney Adventures has a correction involving their uh, Doc Ock versus Squidward Tentacles uh, story they apparently ran in the previous issue. Huh. Um, in our August 2004 Who Would Win issue, we said that Squidward would beat the evil Doc Ock by a score of three to two. Turns out we were wrong. Uh, your votes are in, and the tentacled scientist wins the day. Why would they ever think that Squidward would beat Doc Ock? What, what, what makes them think that? Squidward could just defeat him by refusing to serve him until Doc Ock just gets bored and leaves. Interesting point. Or maybe, like, his, his music is so bad, Doc Ock just, you know. Don't you, like, partially beat Doc Ock in the game? by um doesn't he have like some sort of like a, a force field you need to destroy with like a sonic that is or something? that is in that is um so you're thinking of the the spider-man 2000 video game not the Raimi video okay. game okay. but yes there well there, no so you don't beat doc ock with a sonic bubble you beat carnage with the sonic bubble but doc okay. Ock, okay. um doc ock i mean creates the sonic bubble to contain carnage gotcha so maybe, uh, maybe um, Squidward could beat Carnage, but no way he could beat Doc Ock. Yeah, I mean, Bethany T. 11 from uh, Newt uh, says, Doc Ock is way cooler than Patty Flipping uh, Squid, who plays a clarinet like my great grandma would, parentheticals, if she knew how. <laughs> uh, oh, um, IB, yes, I love Spider-Man video games. Um, I played the Insomniac game a couple of years ago. Well, not a couple of years ago, last year. Um, played both of them. So the original and then the Miles Morales uh, spinoff of it. Both incredible video games for the PS4. Loved every minute of it. 
but my very first Spider-Man video game, uh, at least on a console, was the 2000 video game, which was uh, just, yeah, a lot of fun. You know, we have a whole episode on video games coming out um, in the future with our podcast. So we'll, I talked a lot more. That's what I was just saying. I think that'll be the next one, I think. So I'll talk a lot more about that. Um, and that's one of the, you know, so one of the things that's really cool about Peter and me is um, we, you know, we both love the movies, but we both have some different, there's different things where, you know, one or the other of us is sort of more, you know, the expert for lack of a better term. Um, you know, so we, we have another episode, you know, in the pipeline about the soundtrack in, in, the, in the film score. And that's unquestionably Peter's uh, turf. You know, he's very, very good at breaking that down. Uh, whereas I would say I'm a bit more uh, of, of a veteran of the video games. Um, so unquestionably. Yeah, that's uh, not my realm. Actually, look what I got here, Sean. Um, uh, in, in the flesh. It's my uh, <laughs> uh, ultimate Spider-Man game which made uh, an appearance in an anecdote in our latest episode. Um, and look at this. I paid $9.99. I paid 10 bucks for this. And I had no idea what on. I needed Yeah, Spider-Man for the PS1. Um, KJ Gabriel, um, love, that, love that video game. And uh, I still play it occasionally. Follow. You know, I have it. I have it. I, have, uh, I, have, I, have it for I also have. Uh, right. What? I, I've got a knock at my door, Sean. Who, who could that possibly be? Ah, that's distinctive. That's a very distinctive knock. Oh well, well, well look who it is. It's it's the man himself. Ah. <laughs> it's it's Spider Man. Uh, thanks for joining us. Hey, hey, Spider-Man. Hey, Mr. Spider-Man. Oh, all, all my DVDs in, in Blu-ray. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Spider-Man. Give it, I'm, I've been a, a good, a good Spider-Man fan. And it's, I'm, I'm, this is what happens. You get, Spider-Man comes and he, he, he steals all your DVDs first and then he, then he brings them back. <laughs> thank you. Oh, well, what, what a guy. How's, uh, how's, how's things been for the past 20 years? Oh, oh, thank you. Thank you. Stay in school. <laughs> <laughs> Sage advice from Spider Man himself. J Dominique says John is going to be so jealous that he missed you. Bye. Thank you. Man, I got to start eating my green vegetables. Yeah, well, <laughs> um, yeah, if you want Toby McGuire's advice, uh, artichokes are really good. Um, broccoli and avocado toast. Avocado toast. Uh, man, I was also reading, you know, as a vegetarian, he had to, like, bulk up on so much tofu uh, when he was getting into the, the physical, you know, exercise, um, you know, working out for the part. That's a lot of tofu the man had to go through. Uh, Super Johnny says, so that means that Sean isn't Spider-Man then. So, uh, Ivy, so Ivy just wants Mr. Spider-Man to notice him. Okay, sorry, I just heard. John, he was I right here. Spider-Man was here. I don't he know. was just here. Uh-oh. What was it? I don't it? know where. Uh, Wait, what you got? I, saw, I guess I just saw him on the live, but I was wondering uh, if he was still here. Was it, was, you got your Halloween costume on underneath that? No. Oh, no. I guess it's just a red shirt. I got to do laundry. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, hey, John. John's just here. <laughs> John, you thanks for all the work you do for, uh, for our podcast. A lot of cool guest stars. Okay, bye now. Maybe if we're lucky, Sam Raimi will show up. But probably, probably not. not. Probably not. <laughs> Um, Sean, so over on your side, I see um, KJ from the Emerald Isle has asked uh, our opinion on Spider-Man, the new animated series. Yes, I, I was going to get to that comment. Um, Peter, do you want to field that question? Sure. Uh, well, we're, we're, the answer is we're figuring it out. Um, we're figuring out our opinion. Um, I saw it once you know, closer to when it came out. Sean's never seen it. And so we're currently watching it together and then doing an episode, episode by episode commentary, uh, you know, you know, a reaction to it, I suppose, uh, in podcast form. And that exists as the top tier. Thank you uh, on our Patreon. So 
It's, yes, um, Peter watched it, you know, many years ago, um, but you know, hasn't watched. It. I've never seen it, so it, we're kind of watching it together, and yeah, just kind of recording our reactions uh, almost in real time. So it's it's fun. It's a little bit different. You know, we're not just relying on knowledge from uh, all you know, build up over twenty years. This is something we're doing much more. That's more. Uh, KJ says the personally not a fan, despite it being a quote unquote continuation of the Raimi verse, and um, not to Dep give away too much. Of very, our... yeah, yeah, that's Definitely something we discussed in our, our first episode about it. Um, well, we you know talk about the very kind of unique place it occupies in this continuity. It's it's very it's kind of hard to classify it. Um, if you know where it is, if it's continuation, a spin off, a alternate history, whatever. Uh, whatever you want to use to describe it. Yeah, I think I used the phrase like Venn diagram in our first episode. This it's like yeah. there's Raimi here, and I don't even know what else here. Like, and then there's just a small crossover there. Uh, so you see, KJ also asks, uh, would we want to see a Spider-Man four, or could it ruin the Holy Trilogy? Hmm. Yeah, I. I don't know. That's a good. That's a good question. Super Johnny uh, says, "How would John say he got a cut? That cut in his arm? I'll have to ask John when I see him again. I don't know. I think I. I don't know. Uh, that's one thing you mentioned, Sean, in our um, trying to do better episode. Our one talking about Peter Parker now, as we've seen him in the present day. Um, you mentioned that it's kind of neat that." we don't, you know, give too many definite answers so that we're free to speculate and fill in the blanks a lot with our own headcanon. And um, it's hard to be disappointed then because it can be yeah. whatever you want, you know, something different for everyone. But once you start defining, this is what his life is, this is the specifics of things that happened, you know, after 20 years, there's a lot of expectation people have for where their personal story went. Um, so that's kind of... Could it ruin the Holy Trilogy? I mean, I'm sure may, it would. I'm sure some people it wouldn't align with their headcanon of where things went. But I'm I I think it's worth it. I want to see. I would love to see Toby's world again. I would love to get some closure on certain things, and I would love to see just this older Spider-Man too, which we hardly ever see really yeah. in any medium. I mean, even the comics barely we get much of this older spider well, and, um, and you know i think we mentioned that uh, somewhere in uh, some somewhere in all of our musings we talk about uh, in into the spider verse uh, that middle-aged peter parker was a very interesting one to follow for that exact reason uh, most depictions of spider-man are uh, very firmly high school you know college aged you don't get to see someone who's been a superhero for you know decades um well in the middle age so that's it's, super cool yeah, it's 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 great to yeah, it's great to see that. Man, it's it's two thirty AM where in KJ where KJ is, which makes sense. Uh they gotta go, but they're looking forward to the next episode and the next live. I'm I'm afraid I'm not even gonna try to pronounce Oh that's pronounce uh, that. I, I like I said, I'll try. I know it's probably you're not correct, but slancha. So thanks so much for joining us, KJ. I really appreciate you staying up. To, to get to chat with us and for us yeah. to chat with you. Thank you. It's like I said, just um, that. Yeah, I, this it's wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That's the only Irish I know, but I'd love to <laughs> learn more of that language. I think. I mean, my name is. Um, I always tell people my name is spelled the proper Irish Irish way. So uh, my mom was very made it was very adamant that my name be spelled um, S E A N. And I know hmm. in Ireland, you know, um, I forget which, I know one of the letters has like the accent over it. Um, and if English had accent marks, I would totally do that. Interesting. Well, I never knew that. Um, all right. Uh, well, let's see. I'm going to try. Cynthia mentions that it is weird. She wishes that you could see, we could all see both comments at the same time. And I do wish TikTok had a way to integrate that together because it's kind of odd. But uh, yeah, I see KJ on your said, side said uh, it's spelled the proper way. <laughs> It is. It's not that. Um, well, yeah, the angli anglization of it is just, just it's just wrong. <laughs> um, we have not yet seen Doctor Strange too. I'm trying to catch up with some. Uh, 
comments here. Um, bu, 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 bu. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, uh, not, not too much over, over here, actually. Uh, ba Bailey Trey 5 said, um, did you all think Toby was going to die in No Way Home after being stabbed? Uh, I, I think I probably thought, at least for the first few minutes, that, yeah, it, uh, it, you know, it's, it's pretty common by this point, if you're stabbed by a glider, if you're impaled by a glider, you don't, uh, come back from, you know, you don't come back from that. But, you know. Yeah, it, but... it was, it was definitely a little surprising, and then it was probably even more surprising when he didn't pass yeah. on to the great web in the sky i was like oh okay i guess he's fine <laughs> so uh so i don't know it was it was a real emotional back and forth roller coaster real quick on that one Ooh la la mentions that um they would love to see another sam raimi spidey the more the merrier if it's bad people people can just pretend that it didn't get made so which is true i suppose yeah papa D's mentions that uh, can't believe spider-man is 20 years old i know it's Two decades. Paprika says yeah. uh, you're able to see some of like Uncle Ben and Toby's performances, and uh, I suppose especially in his older performance. And I, that's an interesting point. That's, that's pretty neat. So, um, Chance says there's a way that we can both see each other's comments if he has to join your live and not start his own one. Oh, interesting. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I guess we could do like a picture in picture kind of thing but i kind of hmm. like the split screen sort of thing here but maybe next time we'll try something different hmm. uh like he can be in the chat and then he can request to go live on ours well maybe next time we'll explore that option over on your side i see ib says um he'd love to see a fourth movie with may parker that is spider girl as peter's daughter taking up the mantle hmm yeah, that, that, that's an idea. You know, something a little bit uh, farther in the future, pass it on to the next generation. That, that's kind of, I like that. Yeah, I, I can't remember if um, if it made the cut of the latest episode or, or if it didn't. But I know, uh, I think I mentioned like, you know, we're, we're talking about like what's going on, like what's, what's going on in the relationship between Peter and MJ now, you know, it's complicated. Like, what does that mean? I know, like, I was like, well, like, I'm sure one of the complications is like, should they have kids you know like they, they barely have enough time for themselves like you know is it responsible to bring a, a child into the world especially one that you know you're going to pass on these powers to um yeah. that you know they're going to be in this life as well um I, I can't remember if that made the cut or not i mean i i edited the thing and put it up but i can't remember but um but i mean that's sort of like the those are the sort of questions we could get to see in a spider-man four um with this like older more mature spidey so uh so before i forget i just wanted to um add to the uh add to the pot here um you know if you if you listen to our memories episode and if you already have um kudos to you because that's uh hot off the press but uh peter and i spend a, a, a not a not insignificant part of the episode talking about full screen versus widescreen dvds um, and the choice that people had back in the 2000s uh, for buying DVDs. And so I just wanted to show, um, in honor of the 20th anniversary, this gem of a DVD here. This is the 2002 release, um, full screen Spider-Man, with the two, you know, with the whole second disc just full of bonus features. And, uh, you know, this is something that I have held on to for the last 20 years. Uh, one of my most cherished um, artifacts from from that time, and I, you know, I, I say that, you know, word artifact kind of half jokingly, but you know, I think, yeah, it, it's it was just such a unique phenomenon. Um, you know, back then, superhero movies weren't, um, you know, they weren't super, they weren't they weren't as common as they are now, and so this was a big deal. And yeah, I'm not. I, I, I think can't... it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, we've got like the the backs are somewhat indistinguishable. But it's yeah. inter interesting to see if they had different fronts. Like probably the two most famous posters for the film. You know, mine's widescreen, yours is full screen. So interesting that that differentiates them as well. This is also the cover of the uh, 
the the score soundtrack, oh, as well man. as the uh, the novelization. And then, um, uh, but, but Sean's, Sean's is the one that's the the cover of the the soundtrack, the the music from and inspired by, you know. And interestingly, they um they sort of took a different approach for the video game cover. They have just the yeah. one lens from his mask. And on the back, um, again, this is something we talk about in the uh, Moot Memories episode, just because it, it does form such a big part of the nostalgia we have. It's this um, little logo here for official movie merchandising uh, that was very prevalent on Spider-Man 1 theme merchandise. Um, you know, and again, we talk about uh, the toys, the, you know, the other branding that was just very common at that time. So I, I wish I wish the pieces that I had my battle ravaged spider-man action figure here with me uh, i don't know if we'll ever um see that again but that's okay um i love uh, i love that that blue that really odd sort of distinctive color you know that all those are like early promo materials for spider-man one it gets me so you know nostalgic and that cover of the game is definitely like part of that like it's yeah that particular angle because it, it's different than like the usual, like I said, sort of orangey sunset hue vibe that you generally associate with the trilogy. Um, so it feels very distinctive in my mind and very, very early and very cool because of it. Um, and someone was saying here earlier that they, they collected all of the Spider-Man 3 action figures and they were then able to pass that on to, to their own children. And that that was, Oh, that's really cool. That's very cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll have to, I gotta, I gotta probably see if I can get my hands on more Sparman merchandise. Um, well, like I said, we're definitely no strangers to picking up stuff from our past. I know, um, I bought a, uh, yeah, a couple of years ago, I bought a, uh, Naboo Starfighter LCD game that I had as a kid, but then lost. And so I bought a new one. I know you bought an, a Star Wars, you know, game from Phantom Menace, uh, as well. Your... Oh, uh, Star Wars Simon, yes. <laughs> yeah. That was, uh, yeah. yeah, that was a game I had as a kid that I bought kind of impulsively, uh, just out of, just out of purely nostalgia. Um, and it was about as fun as I remembered. Uh, it's not something you can play for very long, but it's fun. It's a fun little thing to play with somebody because you can sort of, um, have somebody play against you, which is, uh, which is fun. That's true. Or play by yourself, or use use the force, where like it doesn't light up. You just have to go by the sound. Um, Super Johnny wonders if the design decision for the the game box uh, was made by the game development studio. I don't know. I wonder if um, I wonder if maybe it could have something to do with like you know the game is in development with the film and the games aren't that easy to make like maybe the time the way the timetables for things working for the game were much more rushed and they're working off of earlier materials i don't know um so ib says on your side um oh go ahead uh i was going to say do you want to hear the uh little blurb on the back of the game box sure you know i, I mean it's interesting. regala okay so bitten by a genetically engineered spider High school student Peter Parker is suddenly empowered with supernatural abilities, including spider sense, web slinging, and wall crawling. Assume the role of Parker as he adapts to his new powers and becomes Spider-Man. But beware, the city's villains won't be pleased to see a new hero on the scene. Hmm. And if I'm not mistaken, I may be giving a little bit away from our upcoming game episode. But this is your favorite. This is the one that you're probably drawn toward the most of the three. I think I have the most uh, fondness for this one. Uh, absolutely. I know some people might find that um, a bit hard to believe uh, because the Spider-Man 2 game, you know, I think is the most well-remembered now for its sort of groundbreaking presentation um, in its uh, 3D world of New York City that you know, where, and you were able to swing around uh, kind of open world style. But yes, Super Donio, yes, 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 yes. Playing as the Goblin in this game was amazing. Um, 
And I just last year, I finally unlocked it fair and square. You know, in the past, when I was a kid, I would use uh, cheat codes. You know, um, I definitely cheated. But re last year, I decided to beat it legitimately, and I did. And I unlocked the goblin um, fair and square. And yeah, it's a, again, I don't want to spoil too much of the video game episode, but it's really cool because it's not just like an, another skin. It's not just something that you can wear, but you're, you know, playing. Yeah, exactly, John. It's like it made it two games. It was like they had a whole alternate storyline, which was really cool that they took the time to sort of come up with that, even if it really didn't make any sense. And it was just very, you know, changing a lot of superficial things. So it, it was really cool. Um, a lot of a lot of love and a lot of um, effort went into this game. And you know, it could have just been a, a cheap piece of uh, merchandising, just, you know, trying, you know, to be, you know, just to latch onto the movie as, uh, you know, just to entice people to buy it. But they put a lot of uh, thought and creativity into this game. And um, I always appreciated that. And, you know, I think it has a lot of replay value. So. And related to that, Cynthia sent us a, a game pad uh, visual on uh, over TikTok. So thank you, Cynthia. I appreciate that very relevant um so yeah don't worry we have a whole video game episode um well actually two we have one um about just spider-man one's video game and then we have one that sort of talks about the other two movies games uh we have a couple of those uh, in the pipeline here so uh, you know if you uh, want to hey Destiny. uh bailey trey mentions that the the aerosmith spider-man song is so catchy and uh yeah yeah it is uh I really, I really enjoy all, like all of the music from and inspired by albums. Um, and um, we don't have one plan for like this season of the show, but I definitely want to go through and, you know, talk a little bit about some of the songs and some of their placement in the movies and, you know, maybe what they, how each song is sort of relevant to the film. Um, and yeah, having a, uh, each movie did have like its own cover sort of of um, the theme. Uh, Aerosmith did uh, the first one. The second one uses uh, Michael Bublé's Spider-Man. And then the third one had, um, who was it? Uh, the, the Flaming Lips did a cover, which was actually like an exclusive. It's not on the main version of the soundtrack. And it's also not in the um, credits like it is for the first two. But so each one had somebody doing like a cover of the, the theme. Uh, regarding the Raimi merch and the games, uh, IB mentions that the, the blue hues were used in contrast with the warmer ones in the movie. Um, and that they, they know that Sam said that he intentionally liked to take footage of New York uh, during the golden hour. And I think that all, you know, it lends to the really unique visual of the Spider-Man world. It, it's like as, as heightened as the real world could be, you know, because, you, you know, coming off of the 90s superhero movies, you know, largely, you know, like um, thinking of like Joel Schumacher's Batman movies, the world, it was like a very sort of is extremely heightened. It was an unrealistic sort of expressionistic world of like Gotham City that it was creating. Um, you know, with all these somewhat garish colors and neon lights and, you know, large structures that don't really exist in the real world. Even the Superman movies, maybe they have sort of like an idealized look to them. But I know Sam wanted to sort of really ground this in the real world. And yet he kind of took that to like it's the farthest level of that, you know, as, you know, the, like, he's, you know, the beautiful hues of the sunset and, uh, you know, just the way he, ex the, the city is expressed through the camera. So I, th I think it's interesting. Like it, it's grounded, but as heightened as it can be within reality. Well, uh, uh, Ula La mentions I, it was camp and they loved it. Well, um, IB just wrote that uh, Rainey's New York City is uh, among his favorite comic book settings and live action. I just want to say, IB, that uh, we will be doing an episode um, later this season about New York City as it exists in the Raimi movies, because um, I think there's a lot of interesting things you could talk about there. Um, and again, not to spoil too much of our upcoming material, but we we do we will be talking about uh, New York City as it is depicted in these movies, and um, perhaps how 
those depictions relate to real life events or real life things that have happened. So, um, so stay, so stay tuned. We will, uh, <laughs> so we will be, uh, you know, getting to that, um, uh, before too long here. IB says he can't wait to edit that excerpt, uh, for our TikTok page. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And Bailey Trey here mentions that, the the Spider Man movies honestly have some of the best soundtracks. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think, uh, Hero, I think, is sometimes, you know, sometimes joked about maybe uh, for being, you know, I don't know, maybe kind of over the top and corny and everything. But I don't know. I think it, I think it legitimately has left quite an impression. Um, I think that's definitely like sort of the breakout song of Spider-Man 1. Uh, of course, there's Macy Gray's song, which is uh, very interesting. Well, um, uh, and again, uh, Macy Gray, boy. Um... You know, I've heard it. I've heard it said that today more people remember her for being in this movie than for the fact that she had like I, you know, she was a pretty at the time, like you know, two thousand, two thousand one. She was a very popular, um, very popular singer with you know a number of very well selling songs and albums. And um, yeah, you know, she's kind of been lost to. She's been relegated to like I think one hit wonder status. And like I said, mm -hmm. a lot of people today remember her for being in this movie uh more than for her actual uh music career but uh regardless of that it uh blew my mind to hear that she wrote and sang the uh as told by ginger uh theme yeah. i mentioned that in one of the episodes i think i cut it i think it's in the bonus material on patreon but uh blew my mind to find that out so i mean i know her from that i just didn't know uh Spider-Man 2, I love the, you know, the um, hold on music that we hear during the, uh, you know, the montage of Peter getting ready for um, for the play. I play that a lot when I'm getting ready for things. Um, and of course, uh, when the movie ends and it hits that vindicated music, it's uh, it's it's very effective for me personally. Um, Dashboard confessional. Cynthia's back. Cynthia, I hope you were there when I thanked you for the um, uh, the gamepad. Very nice and very topical. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, Ivy mentions his favorite song used in the trilogy is Hold On in Spider-Man 2 when he's getting ready for MJ's play. Absolutely. Um, which is funny. If you uh, Have you ever listened to the... Um, Danny Elfman actually wrote music for that scene. They ultimately decide not to go with it. And it's also very interesting. It's this very sort of upbeat sort of piece. And then it's got like the silliest moment on like a tuba for when uh, uh, Mr. Ditkovich, you know, runs out of the bathroom with his pants down. It's a, it's a very interesting piece of music. I'm happy with the way it turned out, but um, but that, that that's a fun listen if you want to find that. <laughs> I think it's called um, Theater Montage, Danny Elfman Theater Montage. I don't know who wrote the bit uh, the music for the video game here, but I would say it's definitely on par with uh, Danny Elfman's score. Uh, the music in this video game really, really does a great job of capturing the excitement and the action and the heroism, the the stakes. I mean, it's just really, really great music. Um, and again, we you know talked about this in the video game episodes, but the music for Spider-Man Two, the, the, um, unlike the the soundtrack for the movie and the mu the music based on the movie, the CD, the music in the video game for Spider-Man Two is pretty, you know, nothing to write home about. It's so annoying, frankly. Um, I think I mentioned this in the episode. Whenever I've played the game, I just turn the sound off. The, the, I turn the, the music off, leave the effects on, and just play uh, the score <laughs> from the movies. It's the only way to do it, if you ask me. Uh, IB shared some of the, the lyrics to Hold On. Yeah, great song. Great album. All three of them have pretty great albums, I have to say. Um, and yeah, when, when you listen to Hero, you can pretty much hear Toby swinging. It's it's terrific. Um, there's just so much, and we mentioned this in our Memories episode, there's just so many aspects that were all-encompassing us and just sort of all came together to really buoy this whole experience. Like, it was it was an experience of this film coming out. Yeah. And um, it was, you got 
you got to live it and breathe it. You know, my, my notebooks in school at the time were um, like Spider-Man climbing up the walls. It was like that early promo picture. Maybe it was by Alex Ross of him like climbing straight up the wall into the camera. My toothbrush uh, I was using mm -hmm. was Sam, Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man. Uh, um, I.B. Just, uh, I.B. just commented that the best song from the trilogy is actually uh, Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head. And I agree. I love that song. Um, interestingly, it was the very first number one song of the 1970s. It was uh, hit number one on the Billboard chart in January of 1970 um, because of its use in the movie um, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. So uh, it's really cool that that was a song that was popular in a movie that came out, I'm willing to bet, before any of us were born. Um, and then it was repurposed yeah. and uh, gained new cultural relevancy in uh, Spider-Man 2. I mean, to this day, I still associate that song with Spider-Man 2. Um, just, I think that is such a, I, I love that part. I love that. Um, that's what, you know, I think it's one of the most memorable, memorable parts of that movie. Um, when, you know, that whole montage of when Peter's, you know, at least for the moment, he's feeling pretty good that he's made a choice and he's um, no longer bearing the burden of being a superhero. Although I'll, I'll, I'll be honest to this day, every time I take a bite out of a hot dog, I think about that montage. I just think about, you know, when he takes a bite out of that tofu dog and it's just so dramatic. Uh, it just, I think about that every time I have hot dogs. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, that's a classic moment. Again, interestingly enough, uh, Elfman wrote some music for that scene too, which ended up not being used. Elfman wrote a lot of music for Spider-Man 2 that ended I'm, up not being I'm used. I'm going to say, um, I, mean, I love Danny Elfman. I mean, he wrote, the Simpsons theme song, one of the best TV theme songs ever, but I'm actually very glad that they used, uh, you know, BJ Thomas's raindrops are falling on my head. Um, and like I said, to this day, every time I listen to, when I listen to the song, I do the same thing. Like, you know, the part whenever, um, during like the, like the trumpet, uh, you know, sort of solo there, you know, when in the movie, Peter's like trying to fix his bike and the wheel bounces out the window and that guy is yelling at him. I always like, kind of like, you know, either say it out loud or kind of say it to myself. Hey, you punk! Sorry, because I'm totally, uh, you know, uh, you know, that's just the thing I would do. And um, yeah, so love that song. Um, I think it's a great song in its own right. Yeah, it's a very, I think it's a great piece of music, and yeah, it's used to great effect in that movie. Elevates that scene and the film. Yeah, I agree. It was well done there. Um, Roman Holiday fan says, at least one of us, I suppose, in the, the chat here, remembers that song from the past. Uh, so, I'm, so somebody I'm, here I'm, was I'm here for the movie. I'm, I could be wrong. Um, if there's anybody in this uh, <laughs> audience that remembers seeing Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid in 1969, uh, that is really cool. I would love to chat about um, if you listen to Casey Kasem sometime, but uh, if not, that's okay. Casey Kasem, I don't think he's ever come up on the show. Well, actually, I, I name drop him as more of an in-joke to you in the Memories episode. But I know that's one of your um, sort of broadcast heroes uh, that you probably think of, you know, when we're doing our recording sessions, uh, the I, radio host. I like to think, well, yeah, I, I definitely, um, yeah, I love Casey Kasem, um, obviously, you know, a lot of people know him for his voice acting. Um, he did a lot of cartoon voice acting, uh, most famously Shaggy from Scooby-Doo um, for many, many years. Uh, a lot of other characters, too. Uh, I just learned recently he actually in that, you know, in the very old uh, Easter cartoon, um, you know, here comes Peter Cottontail. He uh, he voices Peter Cottontail. And the, uh, oh, the other interesting. thing I remember seeing that, I didn't know it was him. Yeah, and then the other main character is voiced by uh, Vincent Price. So, wow. Yeah, interesting. Interesting. Well, it wouldn't be the first time they've teamed up, though, because, um, like, just last year, I watched uh, a series called The 13 Ghosts of Scooby-Doo, which was, like, a pretty early Scooby-Doo show, relatively early. Um, and it features, of course, Casey Kasem as Shaggy and Vincent Price as the recurring character, Vincent Van Gool, and they're working together to catch real ghosts. So interesting that they've worked together in a couple of different projects. Roman Holiday fan mentions, loved him. Uh, uh, Casey Kasem, that is. 
And uh, Bailey Trey says Sean looks like Topher Grace. So, I mean, again, I, 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 I guess think, I can, I guess I can see it. I said, I said this yesterday during our practice uh, live stream, but yes, um, Topher Grace um, riding some very good publicity right now uh, because um, they are making a that '70s show reboot on Netflix, which I am, uh, I'm actually pretty excited for. It. I, I, I watched the original show, um, you know. I remember my dad watched it on Fox when it was like actually airing, like, you know, in, you know, you know, initially. And then I watched it on Netflix a number of years later. I kind of streamed it and binged it. And, um, you know, I always thought it was a really funny sitcom. And so, you know, I, I think it's cool. It's kind of cool. I mean, Netflix is kind of, I think that that whole idea has been sort of played out quite a bit by now. I mean, I remember, I'm sure a lot of you remember that, you know, back in like, what, 2015, when they announced Fuller House. It was, you know, kind of earth shattering because it was, the, you know, one of the first times um, in a long time that they were sort of, you know, revisiting, um, you know, a 90s era show and sort of updating it for the modern day. And um, with, with that 90s show, it's not quite the same thing, but I guess it's a sequel um, nonetheless. And um, yeah, I think it'll be a lot of fun. Um, you know, it's really cool to have the original cast there with one um, kind of notable exception um you know who will not be joining but uh for very uh unsavory reasons uh, uh a chance mentions hollywood is just full of nostalgia right now um ib says to him uh you look like something of a scientist yourself well thank you uh, I, I personally and... never i i'm not i'm not good at science but uh, i'm glad i can uh, pull that off I brought, incidentally, I just for the sake of showing it off, I also brought on that note um, my uh, Physics of Superheroes book, which I mentioned in the uh, our Memories episode. This uh, this tome right here was part of what inspired me to try to um, take us to see. Uh, I'm, tell I'm telling take, you, take a class you, field trip um, to see Spider-Man Three. You you literally um, followed the plot of an episode of Recess with that scheme, and I love it. Which I didn't remember. I didn't remember that at all. Now, see, this is my kind of physics book right here. Like you know, where like Figure Six and Figure Seven uh, of this physics problem are demonstrating. It's kind of hard to tell, but uh, Gwen falling from uh, a bridge and Peter catching her in a you know less than uh ideal way uh can't quite make it out there but that's that's my kind of physics book when it's got those sort of uh those sort of um you know examples in it uh i've got a, a bookmark in here from 2004 uh tiny little fantastic four bookmark <laughs> from 2004 but uh Chance says uh, he's still getting through Seinfeld as well as as well as Friends right now. Paprika mentions that they listen to Top 40s every Sunday with Casey Kasem when they were a kid. And, yeah. Uh, to ooh la la, la. Yeah, I think I think that was with the Easter Bat that uh, that here comes Pierre Cottontail. I think there was like an Easter Bat or something in that. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I listen to um, Casey Kasem's American Top 40 every weekend. Um, I. I, I personally love the '70s shows the most, so I, I try to listen to those as often as I can. Um, you know, there's so many great songs. Um, I just he, he just has such a style um, that really is inimitable. I mean, nobody could really approximate it. But um, yeah, just a, what a what a legendary talent. What a unique. Um, just yeah, just I'm so glad that we get to still listen to those shows. I know he's um, been gone for uh, a number of years now, but. Um, yeah, that's a, it's a personal, uh, personal passion of mine. And certainly I would love to, I, I love to try to channel his, um, essence when I record with Peter, I can't say that I'm as, uh, smooth or, uh, slick as Casey, but, uh, I try. We're always trying to do better. That's all we can do. Exactly. Exactly. Um, IB says as, as a physics student, they're deeply offended, uh, by the book for its use of, uh, that particular panel from. The night Gwen Stacy, uh, you know, I don't know if TikTok wants me to say it, but, you know, didn't live anymore. Um, and uh, I will say, though, I mean, it's it's effective. Like, I, I definitely I definitely uh, learned that chapter <laughs> pretty well uh, with such an example. 
but uh, I don't know. But anyway, so that was that was my big ploy to try to get us to see Spider-Man three. Um, it didn't work, but give it an honest shot. Um, and I remember from the time too. Um, over on my bookshelf somewhere, I have um, there's like an encyclopedia of Spider-Man that came out around that time, and it includes at the end. Uh, a reprint of the story Homecoming, which, you know, obviously years later would be the name of a different Spider-Man movie. But this one was was called Homecoming because he was just coming back from Battle World, mm-hmm. and um, it was the first issue of Amazing Spider-Man with him in his black suit, which he picked up from Battle World. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so obviously, you know, at that time they were trying to get people familiar with that so, idea of the so that I... costume. So I just, uh, I have a question for the audience here. I, I know uh, I'm curious. Uh, what was everybody up to in 2002 when this movie came out? Um, just thinking about, yeah, about um, 20 years ago, what what was the world like? What were we all doing? Uh, just curious if anybody, uh, you know, listening or watching. Well, I, I mean, that, that can be yeah, very we, well we, true. We, well, we, we discussed that. Some people mentioned that earlier. Like, they've never known a world without Sam Raimi's Spider-Man <laughs> films in them. Wow. Uh, yeah, yeah, Bailey Trey mentions on this side. So it's like yeah, Bailey Trey says, say uh, that, "I was in heaven because I wasn't bored." What's that? Well, I just was going to say, Peter, like you and I have um, never known a world without Star Wars. You know, before you know, we were born right. after May fifth or May whatever it was, nineteen seventy seven. Uh, which, by the way, tomorrow is uh, Star Wars Day, so that's pretty cool. Uh, May the fourth. Yeah, it's also the fifteenth anniversary of Spider Man three. So. I think I'll do some stri- streaming from uh, the Wachowski Brothers channel tomorrow, too, in the name of Star Wars a little bit. But, yeah, Star Wars Day and uh, 15 years since Spider-Man 3. But I guess, you know, you could say that for every movie. You know, anybody born after 1939 has never lived in a world without The Wizard of Oz. Um, anybody born after, I don't know, like 1946 has never known has never known a world without it's a wonderful life. Um, anybody born after 1995 has never known a world without Toy Story. But I mean, I guess it's interesting, um, you know, because we're pretty close to that gap here, you know, uh, like we're, we're, we just made it, you know, by not, not too, too much um, yeah. getting to know the world without it. And then in some ways it did kind of revolutionize, you know, certainly superhero cinema, I would say. Uh, and I'd be particularly interested to hear about people who like are growing up with the MCU already having 20 movies. I mean, how do you even yeah. begin to approach that? But that's sort of a whole different thing. Um, what's what are some people saying here? Um, uh, Ula La saw it twice in theaters and tossed their popcorn from the Green Goblin jump scare. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's I love that. <laughs> um dominique says she was busy trying to become bob ross jr at the time um an artist i see and uh super johnio on your side says he was playing pokemon on the game boy most likely um i was super johnio actually has quite a nice story about them seeing it as a kid and uh if i may sort of tell some of it um they had a, a TV up in their, their room. Um, and even though that they had a, a DVD player down in the family room, they still wanted uh, to get a VHS copy because they had a VHS, a, a VCR in their room. And so they wanted to have that to be able to play whenever they, they wanted. And I think that's great. <laughs> you know, I just want to say that I, um, I, kind of, I kind of miss movies on VHS because... I don't know. Like it was like the whole, the whole buildup was part of the fun. You would have all the previews for all these movies coming out, um, or for video games, or I, I don't know. It was kind yeah. of, I don't know. It was just, it was just a different way of viewing. It was, um, I don't know. Just, I feel like it rewarded patience a little bit more. Hmm. Interesting. Maybe not. Maybe yeah, not. I mean, it it, it was sort of interesting because like. Well, well, there's all like the special effect, special behind the scenes stuff all came at the end. You know, that's kind of different yeah. now. Now you can go in and, 
you know, press it separately, but you had to wait till or fast forward to the end. You had to rewind things afterward. So definitely there was like a, a certain level of custodianship required yeah. uh, with v, VHSs. Um, but I think IB I think, says that. Uh, oh, uh, I'm just going to say, I think we're seeing today um, just with people, people are realizing how much they miss um, physical media of things. Um, you know, for example, you know, how many of us still love to buy books? I mean, I know uh, my fiance and I, we buy books all the time. Um, there's just nothing quite like having that tangible thing in your hands. I think with music, record sales have gone, you know, so uh, they have soared in the last number of years. Again, it's because it, it's so, like you said, Peter, a sense of custodianship, a sense of ownership. It's not just this amorphous thing, you know, kind of floating in the ether that you just kind of stream. It's like when you have um, discs, but especially a VHS, especially a videotape, it's it's there. It's real. It's tangible. You're holding it in your hands. You're holding the movie. You are holding it. You are owning it. It is a finite, tangible thing. Kind of, I feel like it just imparts a, it just imparts a certain grandeur to it that you don't really get when you stream it. At least in my opinion, I don't. I mean, streaming's convenient for sure. It's it's amazing to be able to watch these movies anywhere, anytime. But it was always kind of like you know, and a lot of people wax nostalgic about Blockbuster because half of the fun was going down there, like, you know, picking out the movie, like actually, you know, browsing the aisles and just settling on that physical copy of the movie. It was like an experience. I think when you put a tape into the VCR, a lot of times it was an experience, you know, maybe your family only had the one VCR. You didn't have a lot of TVs. Nobody, you know, it was a, it was a time when not everybody could just watch, on, you know, every, anything on their phones. And so, I don't know, it's just things have changed. Maybe, you know, not for the worst necessarily, but I think I definitely... And I'll say I'm a product of my time. Um, you know, in the 90s, you know, we, I mean, I know I'm sure, Peter, you had a pretty extensive VHS collection. I know I did. I mean, my parents still have our, you know, 1996 copy of Toy Story on VHS. And I, every so often I'll watch it. Just, it, it's just, uh, it's just kind of, it's just fun, you know, because you could watch it on Disney Plus and it's, you know, the movie itself is just as good as ever. But watching it on that VHS copy from your own childhood just really adds an extra, it just adds something a little bit extra that I can't, you know, that it, it's just, it's hard to describe, but um, I think nostalgia is just, um, yeah, it's such a powerful thing. Uh, but ultimately just it, at the end of the day, it's all about feel like, you know, it takes you back to a place where you feel comfortable and warm and happy and just, you're able to kind of lose yourself and remove yourself from the problems of the world for a little bit of time. And um, these movies um, right. do that in space. Well, even thinking about like, say, Spider-Man in general, but like anything, well, Spider-Man specifically, but anything in general, like you can enjoy the movie and the story, but then how do you engage with that? Like we can't live in the world. Like how do we yeah. hold it, hang on to it? And the only way to do that is with like, you know, a VHS or a DVD, a Blu-ray or, you know, these sort of physical things that we can surround ourselves with in in some way get some sort of grasp on this thing that we love because we love it but like we can't it's 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 a <laughs> they're, they're pictures they're pictures and sounds how do we hang on to that and this is the closest way to do it exactly. um bailey trey on my side mentions that vhs was the thing they're part of the last generation that had a childhood involved with vhs um paprika says uh they love vhs um, you mentioned your fiance and Bailey Trey says, tell him that uh, he says, congratulations. Oh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, IB said that uh, my monologue there no. got, got him happily sentimentally crying. Um, so uh, that wasn't my intention, but uh, you know, I, uh, you know, wasn't, uh, wasn't my, yeah, wasn't my intention, but I'm glad, you know, I uh, just, I didn't realize I had such uh, strong feelings about it, but uh, yeah, um, I just, I don't know. I, and again, I never I knew it was in you. I could go on all day about it because, um, again, nostalgia, it's so powerful. I remember having, you know, Nickelodeon, you know, anytime their, their VHS tapes were all orange. Do you remember that, Peter? Yeah, I do. I had some orange Nickelodeon tapes. I think it had a, or at least my brother had like a blue Blues Clues uh, yeah. tape as well, or a blue Monsters Inc. tape. 
Yep, I, I, I exact. Yep, I, I have that one too. It was exciting. I, I, yeah, it was different. It's all, it's all about the tangibility, and it's, it's like your best attempt to try to own that experience. Um, you know, again, streaming just doesn't have quite the same. It just doesn't have the same sort of uh, feel. And you know, it's um, interesting. Um, just last week, actually, for some reason, I was looking up this. You know, um, I was looking up this VeggieTales um, cassette tape that my parents played in the car when, when uh, we were kids. And I was kind of looking it up and, you know, I don't know. I was, I was just kind of feeling a little nostalgic for it because uh, it was just something we listened to a lot. Like I was just thinking, and, you know, we talk about this in the memories episode about my, um, when I was, you know, when I, you know, one of my first movies was Toy Story 2 that I, you know, one of the first movies that I really was, you know, really passionate about. And we listened to, um, you know, the, the CDs in the car constantly or the tapes. Um, again, just things are, things were different before streaming. And, um, you know, when you, and when you were traveling, it's like, you know, you don't know what the radio stations are. You know, it's a pain in the butt to try to figure out what station plays the music you like. So CDs and tapes, I mean, my parents still do that. I know, um, <laughs> you know, they, they're not at all, um, knowledgeable about how to stream stuff and again streaming is great i love being able to listen to, i mean without streaming i can never listen to casey casing as much as i do um like i can tune into radio stations from all over the country you know just last week i think i listened to a radio station in new york um for, to listen to the show i mean it's really cool it's great that i can you know from where i am right here i can tune into a radio station halfway across the world to listen to this program and people there are listening to it at the same time it's it's so it's, and, in, and even just our own streaming here, we had somebody, you know, from Ireland. You know, what, 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 I mean, what business do I have? You're know, talking to somebody over in the Emerald Isle. It's crazy. But <laughs> I'm flattered. <laughs> uh, you know, so, so yeah, I mean, there, there's a place for it all, I think is what you're saying, you yes, know. Exactly. Um, uh, Ula La mentioned Sky Dancers had a pink cassette tape. Uh, Chance asked if we remember Blockbuster stores. I really don't. I never really went to any, but I know I... not too long ago we played the Blockbuster game. You and me. <laughs> don't play that game unless you're like a super hardcore movie aficionado because it is, otherwise it's just going to be very frustrating. Um, but I actually do have, um, Peter, I would say I actually do have some memories of Blockbuster. There was one um, actually right up the street from my parents' house. Um, and we used to go there not all the time, but we, we went there pretty often, um, you know, and I remember, you know, browsing the aisles and, um, you know, trying to find a movie. I think I went, I was more interested in the video games. And I, I know I rented a few games for like the N64 from there. Uh, but, you know, my parents would rent movies. I think we rented like Star Wars from there. Um, so that was how I first saw Star Wars, I think. Uh, later on, my hometown got a family video that, re you know, that kind of replaced the uh, blockbusters. And, but the same idea, you know, it was a video store we could kind of go and rent the DVDs. Um, mm -hmm. So, but I remember Blockbuster a little bit. I, I definitely wouldn't say maybe like a Gen Xer might have a bit more nostalgia than I do. But, um, you know, I, I definitely, again, I, I really, I think it was the experience that people enjoyed and that's what people miss. I don't think anybody misses the late fees or the limited selection or, um, you know, you know, the scarcity if they if, you know for a popular movie that had all its copies rented out nobody misses that but people miss but it's the browsing the browsing is fun you exactly I mean, you can browse a little bit on on shopping online but like nothing really beats like walking through a toys r us you exactly. know yeah, that's exactly you don't know what you're going to see when you round the bend what kind of display is going to be out um the exciting like oh i don't know if they have it they have it. oh they do have it you know exactly it can be frustrating yeah. if they don't but yeah, so um, there is something something to be said for that. So um, um, I, I yeah. commented that um, he remembers getting Thomas the Tank Engine tapes from his library's video store. I was a huge, 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 huge Thomas fan when I was a kid. Um, I had all of the tapes, and, you know, Thomas was one of my obsessions for – it was my earliest obsession, honestly. Uh, when I was, like, you know, three, four years old, Thomas was my whole life. Uh, my room, my, you know, my – you know, where I used to live was Thomas themed. I had Thomas toys, Thomas stuffed animals, Thomas, the trains, like the metal trains, the wooden trains. I had all of it. Um, <laughs> so, um, 
you know, I could talk about Thomas all day. And uh, IB, did you have you ever heard of the show uh, Shining Time Station? Uh, because that it was actually that TV show that they used to sort of introduce Thomas to the American audience because Thomas originally was, you know, it was from the UK and it was narrated by Ringo Starr. But um, they tried to import it into the US on this PBS TV show in the 90s called um, Shining Time Station. And, uh, oh, okay, so you do know Shining Time Station. My favorite character was Schemer. Uh, he's hilarious. But, um, yeah, and so in the U.S., they had George Carlin, you know, the seven dirty words comedian. Yeah, George Carlin, yeah. Um, he did it instead of Ringo Starr. But I think you can't go wrong with either one of them. I love the Beatles, so Ringo Starr is um, somebody that I'm very, uh, very much a fan of. But I love, you know, George Carlin was what I grew up watching. You know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know about the U.K. version until uh, later on, but. Um, so George Carlin, to me, is still Mr. Conductor, even though he is obviously a very uh, well-known comedian in his own right, has a whole career, 99% uh, of which is not Thomas related. But um, I still know him first and foremost as Mr. Conductor. So. <laughs> oh. um, um, yeah, ooh la la. So Ringo Starr, they're, you know, they're big Ringo Starr fans. Dominique mentions uh, she was a, bar uh, a Barney girl in a Barney world. Um Bailey Trey says uh, Bob the Builder was cool as well. Dominique says now she's terrified of Barney. So a little <laughs> bit ironic there. Uh, IB, but, um, just, uh, IB, I just wanted to say that at one time, uh, Thomas and the Magic Railroad was like the biggest thing in the world for me. So uh, it's funny because that movie, I I haven't watched it in 20 years probably, but I know that I think it has like two, like 5% on Rotten Tomatoes. It, it, is not, it is not aged well with the critics, but um, still... You know, and like I said, I mean, Alec Baldwin has bigger problems these days than the fact that he was in this movie, but um, he was in it. So something to think about. It must have been my first Alec Baldwin movie. I also saw that in theaters. Um, I remember really loving it. I remember being really taken aback by yeah. the magical world of Thomas in that. And uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the like the the magical train they were looking for. Uh, I was very scared of the whatever yeah. the train with the claw was. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, I just before I don't want to get too far down this rabbit hole, but there are some very interesting videos out there that sort of dissect Thomas. And it's basically like this really dystopian society where trains are sort of in this race war against one another. Like you have steam engines on one side, diesels on the other, and you have the humans that sort of exploit both sides, um, you know, and trains are only... Wow. They're only allowed to live if they're really useful engines. Yeah, it's pretty dark if you like kind of think about it in a certain in a certain way, or as um, Obi Wan Kenobi said, from a certain point of view. So very prescient with Star Wars Day upon us. Diesel exactly. Ten, IB says, was the name of the movie. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, Ula La mentions is how weird it is that uh, George Carlin was on a you know, little kids show, uh, Starlight Express. Anyone, and then. Matthew, my brother, says, uh, you have a train to catch. <laughs> um, no, IB, I yeah, agree. I'm like, it's kind of, IB, I just wanted to say that I agree. I don't like, I didn't like learning about these theories because they sort of take a little bit of the magic um, out of like something that was such a big part of my childhood. But at the same time, um, like, it, I mean, it's interesting. I always enjoy, you know, one of the things we do with our podcast is certainly to Think, look at look at things from a new angle and certainly it, it was interesting to see um you know learn about to see it from that side but I, I will say from what i've read the guy that wrote the thomas books um he was this englishman who genuinely was not happy that steam engines were getting replaced by diesel engines and so um you know he sort of was very passionate about preserving steam engines again something that you know nobody takes the train these days anyway regardless of whether it's steam or diesel but it, i guess in the 1940s that was a big thing so back when train travel you know was a lot more um you know ubiquitous yeah yeah we're i mean we're not uh you know chance bailey trey says you know some theories are cool a lot of them are crazy i mean we're not exactly strangers to theories ourselves on our show but you know i i like you said it's interesting to find different perspectives different ways of you know approaching something and appreciating it and uh, IB is alluding to um, uh, IB is alluding to um, a zombie, uh, the zombie version of uh, 
of this this character. Uh, mm-hmm. he, he's got a series <laughs> on his TikTok channel where he's uh, he's not a big fan of it. He's not really a big fan that they did that in the comics, but also that it does. Like, you know, when you push a character like Peter Parker to, to such extremes, what do you find about the core of that character? Uh, and so that's sort of what they're alluding to there. But but speaking of which, so let's maybe try to bring this, uh, probably bring this little celebration toward its conclusion here. But, but yeah. let's kind of do it on the note of like, what, what is it? that we love about this, you know, like, can we put our finger on this in any way, you know? Um, Because yeah, there were other big movies, other big superhero movies at the time, you know, the other, you know, what is about this that struck a chord with us as a child and has continued to do so since? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, And I think, for me, I think it was seeing the movie in theaters and then having that experience at home with video games that really um, sort of encapsulated it in my mind. Um, and, and I think the games themselves were a lot of fun, a lot of action. And it, it wasn't like super gory. It wasn't like super bloody or over over the top sort of violence. It was just, you know, a good solid beat em up game, a lot of fun, some, you know, a lot of uh, fun levels, great bosses to battle. And so the video games for me, at least really made, you know, it, those were left a big impression. And then the movies themselves were, you know, a lot of action, a lot of, you know, interesting combat. Um, they were just fun to watch. I, I mean, I don't know. I think, I think at, the, at their core, the movies, are, they tell stories that are inherently appealing and relatable about growing up, coming of age, right and wrong um you know learn you know learning about your true self i mean these are all profound questions that people have struggled with for thousands of years um so yeah i think the, the movies just are i mean they're they're really cool because they show all this amaze these amazing action sequences these amazing battles um you know this you know the there's a lot of flashy things on the screen but i also think they they have lasted the test of time because of you know their their emotional core um, and the and the stories that they try to tell, which again are uh, very relatable, uh, are you know very 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 uh, familiar stories to anybody. Um, you know about you know again finding yourself right and wrong, coming of age, um, you know uh, you know uh, atoning for your sins, um, all these ideas about uh, what does it mean to be a good person, what does it mean to live a good life. Um, with the circumstances that you're given. I mean, these are, they're all, all sorts of things that I think these movies kind of speak to. And, um, you know, so I guess as a kid, you can appreciate them for certain things. As you get older, you appreciate them for different reasons. You don't lose what you appreciated before, but you, um, you know, you gain an additional, maybe deeper appreciation. So I think that's kind of, that's kind of my answer. I think I started out, I dipped my toes into the water with a very flashy, you know, the video games, the action, and as I got older and got deeper and deeper into this pool, I certainly uh, started to appreciate them on uh, some deeper levels, uh, a lot of which has been because of my conversations with you, Peter. So um, thank you for helping me become a better fan, a more engaged fan of these movies. Um, you know, so I think. So I think well, that, well, uh, that that's been kind of my trajectory. What, well put, I got to say, and um I want to sort of maybe take what you said and maybe just phrase that a little bit differently. But what you said, like the movie, and I'll I'll read some of the comments that we're getting here about it too. But like the movies have, I think this both breadth and depth to them, which I think is something that you're getting at here. Like, you know, we have the eminently relatable everyday struggles of this nerdy sort of outsider kid, you know, young adult trying to find his way in the world trying to live up to expectations. And then at the same time, on the other side, we have this, it's this mythical struggle of use of like right and wrong, good and evil, you know, fate, destiny, um, dreams, desires. uh, And it it crosses this boundary of, you know, the everyday and the extraordinary. And then of course we have 
you know, these larger than life battles we see, as well as these very intimate human scenes between characters like Peter and his, you know, uncle, his aunt, uh, MJ, you know, the, you know, the maybe all too familiar for some people, um, you know, struggle between brothers essentially to try to, you know, for, for a, a parent's love, you know, try to compete for, for that. So like they're, they're, they spin out in all these different directions and also they go so deep, I think too, you know, there's so much, you know, wealth put onto the screen, you know, through the acting, through the set design, the music, the directing, even like, um, you know, just a little detail, like when uh, Peter's leaving his house in the morning in Spider-Man 1 um, to go to school, you see, um, you know, the lawn is trimmed and everything. There's flowers growing. Um, not only that, though, but you can see, like, the sidewalk around the around the flowers. It's wet. Like, it's recently been watered. You know, this is a, a house of nurturing, of growth. And then, when, of course, when MJ walks out of her house, lawn's dirty. You know, it's strewn with uh, bikes and toys and, and garbage and, you know, the, it's unkempt. But like, you know, so, I mean, that would have been enough, you know, for instance, just to show a dirty house, a nice, nice, you know, clean um, lawn. But like I said, going the extra mile and like showing that it was like the flowers are recently watered. Uh, there's not just one example, like there's so much depth to the struggles and the desires of these characters and how they're portrayed in the world. And I think, you know, uh, you know, like you said, like you can appreciate it on one level and you, you, uh, the more you experience it and the more you, you know, let yourself engage with this world, you continue to see all these more levels and they, they all exist at the same time. Mm -hmm. And uh, it strikes a lot of chords at once. Now let's see what uh what some people are saying here. Um, for one thing, IB says, dang, Sean, you and I are not so different uh, on your side. <laughs> I'm, I, I, um, I know, and I'm, I'm so glad, like I said, uh, it's not often you meet somebody else that is uh, aware of and appreciates uh, Shiny Time Station, you know, one of the uh, <laughs> one of the big, you know, formative pieces of my childhood, um, what I watched on TV, so. Well, as um, as Ray, Bailey Trey Five says over here, Raimi Spider-Man is relatable, funny, action-packed, emotional, dramatic, and for all ages. And yeah, that's I mean that goes a long way too, frankly. Just being, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's accessible absolutely across the generations. It, exactly, it's it's a very accessible movie. What's that? You don't have to be somebody who's read comic books or oh, yeah, accessible. You know, yeah, like you don't have to be somebody who's necessarily read the comic books or watch superhero movies your whole life you could you know not know anything about spider-man like i didn't know that much about him um you can go in and watch that movie and be you know entertained no. perhaps enriched in some way mm -hmm. well i know that um i know kirsten dunce has mentioned that that's one of the uh one of the reasons that she was interested because when she heard that toby mcguire was going to be spider-man she was like well he's kind of a kind of a small indie actor you know, and that kind of attracted her because it felt she felt like it was going to pay attention to the character and really pay a lot of respect. And, and I think the movie does have sort of an indie angle to it. And it, it, there's an incredible amount of character work in all three movies. And that's really, you know, stories are great, but you only care about stories because of the characters. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's where a lot of our discussions come from. I know Paprika says even. Nick thought one of the Spider Man movies should be up for an Oscar. Um Ula La says, Toby's Peter has a lot of heart. Bailey Trey Five says, um, you know, Spider-Man is just so relatable. Money problems, girl problems, life problems. And the films perfectly capture that. Uh, Ula La, you know, sort of, again, stresses that mundane struggle on top of the superhero responsibility. Um, Paprika mentioned, uh, they know uh, their nephew was shocked about how much uh, his grandma liked the movie. I know I was shocked that my nanny was a big fan of the movie. Um, you know, like you said, like it crosses generations. It's just a great story and a great movie. And then over That's on your saying, side. These are, these are like themes and, um, you know, types of things that, again, they appeal to any generation. I mean, good versus evil, uh, you know, choosing the person you want to be. These are stories that, you know, have been told literally, you know, 
you know, the earliest books of the Bible, you know, talk about these things. I mean, these are, you know, and other ancient sources too. I mean, these are all things that, you know, humankind has found fascinating for, you know, just for thousands and thousands of years. And we've talked a little bit in some of our episodes about like the biblical, you know, allusions in the first one in particular. And of course there's a lot of Christ imagery in the second one. And, you know, the, the, a church is a big part of the, <laughs> third one so i mean there's a lot of this like mythical deep so, uh and I just, you know uh, grounding to that as well exactly. and i just wanted to kind of graft onto that um for you and me personally peter um in addition to the you know, to the movies being just having the breadth and depth uh you know they're in their own right um uh, i think for you and me we also you know let on, on top of all of that you and me we sort of have this very intense nostalgia because uh you know these movies came out during our childhood and we all we both have a lot of very you know, very fond memories of either seeing the movies, being excited for the movies, the toys, the video games kind of growing. We basically grew up with these movies. Um, you know, when these movies came out, we were like, you know, nine years old. Um, and when they, when the last one came out in 2007, we were, you know, into our teen years. I mean, we kind of grew up with these movies, um, you know, and they've been a part of our lives and they've really, you know, so I think, you know, on top of all of the movie, the, you know, the artistic merit of the movies, um, that they have in their own right, we, you know, they take on added emphasis and added importance in our lives because of the, I think of the intense nostalgia, you know, for, for those childhood years and just the, the sense of childhood, like, you know, the child, like wonder that uh, we had with these movies and the excitement that we had. And we just, you know, it's, it's always so much fun and so nice to kind of revisit those memories. And every time we watch these movies, we are kind of revisiting those years. We're kind of, you know, we kind of get to take a step back and remember what it was like to be nine years old or 10 years old or, you know, getting excited for, you know, like you talk about making that cake, you know, having a countdown on your wall. I, of course, had the video games and I had the action figures and just um, playing it at school. Just um, it's just so much. It's so fun to um, reconnect with, um, you know, our childhood in that way. And we get to we get to do that every time we watch and every time we talk about these movies. Uh, but we're also you know, we're also able to appreciate it. kind of does take you back to that. Yeah. yeah, and so I think that, for you and me at least, I think that's a big part of why these movies have stuck with us. Um, they really... Um... It's definitely true of us. It's it's interesting to see, though, like a lot of people here, like we said, um, you know, they, they were they were not born in a world without these. So, like, and yet they still came came to it, and it's continued to mean a lot for them, out of all the choices they had of things to watch growing up. So... Uh, but yeah, for us, definitely, it's definitely tied into a lot of formative years. Over on your side, just to wrap up with these comments, Super Johnio says um, he felt connected to Peter. Uh, he was a nerd, too. He was able to see a nerdy guy get powers and fight evil. Uh, but it was tragic, and I wanted to keep coming back to see if he would eventually win. Uh, IB, also on your side, says it felt realistic. You see Peter's selfishness, his sadness, his anger, his hope. He's human. And I think that's a great point, too. Like, Peter is a incredibly fallible character, yeah. but constantly, like, trying to be the best person he can be. You know, like, he feels bad when he's, he, he suffered. He's human. You know, there's things he wants, things he needs, you know, and he's like, what am I supposed to do, as he says? And we see it in the first one, we see that in the second one, we see just how bad he can get in the third one. But, uh, I, that means a lot for for a superhero to be that fallible. He said, as a as a kid, I was hooked in by the spider, the superheroics, the costume, the visuals. But now I'm engaged uh, to see the struggle of the man, and struggling with the ideas of fate and choice. It, I, spider I Man. That's, that's basically yeah, my. That, that's my experience too. You know the. That's the what he action. said. You're not so different. That yeah. Spider Man one responsibility. Spider Man two sacrifice. Spider-Man 3, forgiveness. But the overall theme is choice. And I think that's that's true. Um, you know, both goblins essentially t teach Peter a lesson in choice. You know, we are who we choose to be, you know, and we can always choose to do what's right. Uh, oh, and that's what IB says here. It's the choices who make us who we are. And we can always choose to do what's right. Whatever battle comes our way, whatever battle rages inside of us, we always have a choice. And, uh, as Bailey Trace says over here, Raimi Spider-Man is going to live on forever. And as John Motechko says, sounds like there's so much to tell. <laughs> <laughs>
So, well, I, mean, that's, I think that's a great way to. I wrap, think this has been up. a really nice celebration. Yeah, beautiful. Been, I think we really, I, I really liked what we, what we all said here. Um, Twenty years, and we're so. I know I'm grateful, and we're also grateful that Sam Raimi, a true fan and a true artist, was able to bring all of his experience together and really give us this gift that has meant so much to us and will continue to mean so much. Um, you know, not just as a movie, not just as a popcorn flick, but as like a real integral piece of our development. You know, I, I like seeing sometimes that phrase online, like, hey, show some respect for the Spider-Man that raised us, you know, and that's kind of <laughs> true. Uh, so yeah, as, as we're closing up here, Dominique says, Dominique says, thanks for the good times and the good vibes, guys. And, uh, and we'll thank all of you for, for joining us on this, you know, wonderful occasion. Uh, we get yeah. to celebrate such a something we all love so much. So yeah, it, this has been uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, uh, everybody who's tuned in and watched um, and commented. Um, it's been, oops, sorry, it's been uh, I've had a lot of fun, uh, you know, just chatting with all of you. And uh, we look forward to sharing our thoughts on Raimi Spider-Man, uh, Peter and I, for, for a long time to come here. So, uh, you know, thank yeah, you. So you'll, you'll know where to. Yeah, you'll know where to find us, you know, on the So Much to Tell TikTok or SMTT podcast over on Twitter. Uh, we've got a Patreon now. Uh, the links to the Patreon are at the bottom of the descriptions of our episodes, wherever you get the, your episodes. And yeah, the two new episodes today. So we hope you enjoy those. But uh, but thanks, everyone. Super Johnny says thanks, guys. Thank you all. So yes, thank you. Happy Spider-Man Day to everyone. Happy Spider-Man. See y'all later.